This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and finally, this is the Dell XPS 17, their first 17-inch XPS in God, a long time. So as you might expect, well, the XPS 15 kind of got swole, but not really so much swole. It's not really thicker or bulkier. It's just a little bit bigger in footprint. It's not that much bigger, though, surprisingly. It's currently, Dell says, the smallest 17-inch laptop on the planet, and I don't think that they're lying about that. And it's 5.53 pounds, which is 2.5 kilograms. So it's not much heavier than XPS 15. Pretty darn light, especially for something with the usual robust CNC aluminum casing, nice rigid 4K display with a touchscreen, all that sort of stuff. We're going to look at it now. So first off, this is a laptop for creators, and creators with some money, too. We'll talk about pricing in a minute. This is not supposed to be a gaming laptop. They make the Alienware line for that sort of thing if you're looking for a gaming laptop. What does that mean? It's very thin and relatively very light. So the thermals here, that means we have a vapor chamber cooler, which is a good thing, nice, effective thing, but it's not like so thick that you can have a whole lot of cooling solution inside. It's perfectly adequate for things like, well, video editing, which is one of the target purposes for this for doing photo editing seriously because gorgeous, gorgeous 4K to screen. We'll also talk about the screens in a minute. And obviously if you're doing some 3D renders and all that sort of thing because, aha, uh -huh, the top of the line GPU option for this is the NVIDIA RTX 2060 Max-Q. Now that is not going to put you over the top if you're playing Metro Exodus or something like that. You could do better with an RTX 2070 or 80 obviously for serious gaming. Again, not a gaming laptop, but that's just enough lump for those of you who are doing content production. Unless you're doing immense renders professionally and then you're still going to want a mobile workstation with something even more powerful, maybe a Quadro a GPU even, but you get the idea. The display on this, hmm, there, you got two options here, and neither of them is bad, which is a refreshing change. The full HD plus, it, I say plus because this has a 16 by 10 aspect ratio, just like the other XPS models in 2020, but that one is 500 nits, and it's got full sRGB coverage. Not too bad. That one's not touch. And the display we have is a 4K wide gamut, so we're talking 100% of Adobe RGB coverage here, and it's touchscreen. It's glossy, but it's got an anti-reflective coating on it. Not that you can really see it, but when you look at it, you think, well, that's not really very glary for a glossy display. It's pretty effective at cutting reflections. That one's also rated at 500 nits, according to Dell, though we measured a little higher. The first thing I said when I opened it was like, oh my god, the screen. And you know, I've reviewed hundreds of laptops. I've seen a lot of nice displays, but they did a very good job with this display. Not a disappointment, to say the least, and great for content creation or anybody who enjoys pretty screens, wide gamut. Yeah. It's an IPS family display. It's sharp. It's probably a sharp IGZO display. It's not OLED. I don't think there's a 17-inch OLED on the market. Samsung hasn't put one of those out. But anyway, there's color accuracy and other things that are involved that make me, and power management issues, make me prefer actually an IPS class display over OLED, even if OLED's pretty. Inside, it's pretty expandable, which is a good thing. You have two RAM slots. You can get with as little as 8 gigs or as much as 64 gigs of DDR4 2933 megahertz RAM. So yay that. It's upgradable. Alienwares aren't upgradable these days unless you go to the big chonky Area 51M. And we have two M.2 SSD slots supporting NVMe. So not bad for something this thin and this light. And that's good because if there's something you're going to invest as much money in as this, you're going to want to be able to upgrade those things afterwards if need be. Now, the lowest end configuration is a Core i5 only Intel UHD 630 graphics and 8 gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD and a full HD display. You can get that for around $1,300, $1,400. So, you know, Dell, they always they have every configuration possible, including something that's very low end that most of you probably won't want. There is a middling configuration that is under $2,000. That one gets you a Core i7, the NVIDIA GTX 1650 Ti graphics card, eight, and 16 gigs of RAM and a 512 gig SSD. And that's starting to sound better. Still the full HD display. Our model is $3,000, as much as an Area 51 MR2, big honky gaming laptop. And that gets you this lovely 4K display, the 8-core i7. These are all 10th gen, 45 watts CPUs. And it gets you 16 gigs of RAM and a terabyte SSD. So that's looking better there. That's pretty nice. And of course, the RTX 2060 Max-Q. So who's this laptop for? You can guess already. It's very premium, and it's quite nice for the money. It's not like you're getting crap from the price. Let's put it that way. But obviously, it's going up against the 16-inch MacBook Pro. And also for Dell XPS 15, 
upgraders who always want a bigger display but don't want to carry a lot more and maybe even want more horsepower like that RTX 2060 Max-Q that you, you know, well, wow. By the way, this is also available with an 8-core i9 CPU. Thermally speaking, I'm not sure if I would recommend that. I think the 8-core i7 is the sweet spot for those of you are looking for a lot of horsepower and performance. This has killer Wi-Fi 6, which is really an Intel-based card. It's the 1650S inside, a white backlit keyboard with Dell's usual 1.3 millimeters of key travel. It feels more tactile, though, than some of the previous XPS keyboards, and so at least there's that. It's not just like harsh, abrupt, uh, you're bottoming down and making you very aware of the fact it's short travel. It's, it's decent enough. And you have a Microsoft Precision trackpad. It seems to be the exact same one that you get on the XPS 15. It's large here. It doesn't look as immense as it does on the XPS 15, of course. And there's no rattly, no clicky weirdness like we saw in early XPS 15 units for 2020. But it, ours in particular, I don't know if they're all like this, but it's a little bit weird. If you click dragging or something like that, it's like you really have to keep pushing down the trackpad or it thinks you've let up on it, which can make things like screen captures and drawing rectangles in Photoshop, that sort of thing, for selections, uh, kind of maddening. Hopefully it's just our unit that has that problem. For biometrics, it has both a Windows Hello IR camera and it has a fingerprint scanner that has its own dedicated button in the keyboard. Both of them work quite well and are pretty fast, so nothing to complain about there. The port situation is just about as bad as a MacBook Pro, but a little bit better. You have four Thunderbolt 3 USB-C ports, and you've got at least a full-size SD card slot as a nod to creators, and there's a headphone jack. Happily, at least, Dell does include a small dongle in the box that has a USB-A and HDMI set of ports on it. Battery life on this, it's going to depend, obviously, which GPU you get and what you're doing with it. But say you're doing light to moderate productivity work and are calling on the GPU. We have this 97 watt hour battery in here. That's pretty darn nice. In fact, there's a lot of thin like gaming laptops that won't give you that much battery power. So as you can, say, can guess, battery life is pretty good for something of this performance level. For our RTX 2060 Max-Q edition with the 8-core i7 inside, Battery life is much like the XPS 15 that we have in for review that we reviewed a while ago. You can find that on our channel as well, which means about six hours. So it's not going to beat out, say, the 16-inch MacBook Pro, but that's still pretty good for something this powerful. Obviously, if you really dropped your brightness and did all sorts of little things to try to manage your power, you might get more out of it. Or if you're doing something more demanding or up the brightness, it'll be worse. This uses a USB-C based charger, very compact. So what's unusual here is that it's a 130 watt charger. USB-C maxes out at 100 watts. So Dell had to do something special here to get that working. So some folks have noticed when you're doing things like playing games and really demanding stuff that keeps the CPU and the GPU activated that the battery level might actually go down some. So you play, oh, Metro Exodus for an hour. You might see it go from 95% down to 82%. So apparently the system can draw more than even 130 watts or so Dell says. So therefore there are times when it might actually hit the battery as well for some power. Not the end of the world to me. It depends on just how much time you're going to spend gaming for a laptop whose primary purpose in life isn't gaming. If you do want a game though, hey, I can't blame you. The 2060 Max-Q is good enough, especially with this CPU, to play certainly today's AAA titles on high for the most part. There's a few that are a little bit more piggish, like Control and, you know, sometimes Metro Exodus, that will get you a bit lower frame rates, but generally speaking, Fine. And given the fact that this is a 60 hertz refresh display, and it's not fast in terms of milliseconds, you know, it's about a 40 second millisecond display. This is not primarily a gaming display, and there's no point to playing it over 60 frames per second if your display isn't supporting it anyway, unless you're using an external monitor. And, well, then the world's your oyster. Try to get as many frames as you can. You should certainly exceed 60 on high, saying Far Cry or something like that. So how about thermals, the bugaboo for Dell? Well, the vapor chamber cooler certainly does help, and they're supposedly using higher quality VRMs and all this sort of thing. And for our model with the 8-core i7, which is a demanding enough CPU in terms of thermals and performance, and the RTX 2060 Max-Q, it does pretty well. Now, you just have to get used to the way Dell does things, both with their Alienwares and with their XPS laptops. If these are high performance, they pretty much don't put much of a thermal limit on these. So even doing something like... Um, Buyer strike or time spy benchmarks or something like that. It's happy to let those CPUs ramp up if they need to to 99 centigrade. So 
yes, they can get high. Most of the time when doing the kinds of work this was intended to do, like say Adobe Premiere, then the CPU temperatures were typically 80 to 85 degrees when doing things like exporting 4K footage and all that sort of thing. That's acceptable, certainly. It doesn't make me worry about the longevity of the machine. Playing something like The Witcher 3, which granted is an older game but a demanding game, well, then you'll see temperatures, certainly, if you're playing on high or ultra settings, going up there to 90, 95 centigrade, which isn't actually any worse than some gaming laptop, so there's that. To get the bottom cover off, you remove the Torx T5 screws. Very easy. It's all downhill from there. I say that because this thing, this bottom lid is on there so tight, which gives it a seamless unibody look, which is really nice. But I mean, uh, <laughs> it's user hostile kind of design there that it's so hard. It chewed up some of my plastic guitar picks. So I had to resort to the old iFixit clam knife very carefully to pry this off. Also, this is very sharp around the edges. I mean, I have steak knives that are not as sharp as this, these edges right here. Be very careful when you take that off and don't stick your finger in between because you just might lose part of your fingernail there. Okay, enough complaining. Here we are inside. There's the 97 watt hour battery taking up quite a lot of space. Yay to have that size battery. Here's our speaker drivers right here. A good size. And the sound on this is pretty decent. They do vent and fire upward. Not too bad sounding at all. Not amazing, but pretty good. Two M.2 SSD slots right here. So yeah, you can have two. That's our boot SSD under there. This cover is included, even though we don't have a drive under there. And our two RAM slots. Love to see that. Hope that comes back someday with the Alienware M series of laptops too. I'll take off the Mylar heat shield covers. RAM, RAM. Two good size fans here. They're 10% bigger, I believe, than the XPS 15. Makes sense. They got about 10% more space to work with and put those fans in. And one very large vapor chamber cooling assembly. When you put the bottom cover on, just be mindful the display cable does route out the back here and there's a little cutout in the cover so that it won't be pinched. Razor's not the only one doing that sort of thing. And the Wi-Fi card is over here. The leads are held down over here by this metal cover. This is soldered on, so that's not upgradable. It's a good card, though. It's a good Wi-Fi 6 killer card, so shouldn't be a problem. So that's the Dell XPS 17, their first really big boy in a while, and it is a nice laptop, as it should be for the price, right? You've got a variety of configurations available that could bring the price down, but let's face it, we all want that RTX 2060 Max-Q, don't we? And maybe even an 8-core i7. Uh, the thermals on this are good enough for what they're intended for, which is content creation mostly and some occasional gaming. Again, if you want a gaming laptop, go get a gaming laptop. There are pretty socially acceptable looking ones. For example, the Gigabyte Aero 17 HDR with a wide gamut 4K display for those of you who really want more powerful graphics and fans that are designed for it. But anyway, gorgeous screen on this. Very good build quality, nice expandability. So for those of you who like the XPS 15 but just want a bit more screen real estate, well, this is exactly what you wanted. Or if you were thinking about a 16-inch MacBook Pro but you prefer Windows, well, obviously, yeah, this is probably a good choice for you. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.